Are we live? You're live. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. So today we're going to deal with one of the strangest subjects in the entirety of the concept of Jewish lineage. Jewish lineage is a big deal. It's like a, a lot of emphasis placed on the fact that the Jewish people in the land of Mitzrayim maintained a, a purebred lineage, that they were not the products of rape or incest or assimilation, intermarriage. There's a, a lot of emphasis later on when we talk about the tribes of Israel where Hashem's name is added to the tribes, and the emphasis is that this, they are who they say they are. They are their, the, the parents of their children and the parents of the children only. So with so much emphasis placed on lineage, today's uh, study, today's learning is going to begin by talking about the lineage of the leadership of the Jewish people, which will provoke a very, very unusual question. We're going to pick it up at the second reading, chapter 6, verse 14. Eile Roshei Veis Avosam. These are the heads of the fathers, the houses of the fathers, which is generally speaking, how lineage is established for the Jewish people, what tribe you are, follows who your father is. Whether you are Jewish or not, follows your mother. So the Pasuk begins and tells us, these are the, those heads, B'nei Reuven, the children of Reuven, B'chor Yisrael, who is the eldest, the firstborn of Israel, who is Jacob. And the Torah goes on to list a number of names, Hanoch, Ufalo, Chetzron, V'charmi. And then the Pasuk concludes, Ela Mishpachos Reuven. These are the families of Reuven. Okay. So the obvious question is, why are we talking about this now? It's like the narrative is just starting to, to really build and Moshe Rabbeinu was sent on a mission and the mission seems to be a failed one. He's deeply frustrated. He feels horrible. He's made things worse for the people. Hashem says to him that you'll see and here we are ready to rev revved up, ready to go. Moshe Rabbeinu says, but I can't speak. Aaron will be your spokesperson. All of a sudden, the Torah interrupts. It says, okay, now let's talk about Reuven. And we're going through the family of Reuven. So Rashi says, Because it's now necessary for us to give the background of the tribe of Levi. Why do we need to do the background of the tribe of Levi? So that we can trace the lineage of these new leaders who are now being introduced to us, Moshe and Aaron, who are from the tribe of Levi. So, Beshvil, Moshe and Aaron, because of Moshe and Aaron, Hischeliacha, Sam Derech, Teldei Samiruvein. So, we don't start from the tribe of Levi, because that would be very disrespectful, as if to, there's only Levi, they're not the only Jews. So we start from the beginning. We go through Uvein, and then Shimon, and then Levi. And once we get to Levi, we stop, because that was the whole point. Rashi says, in the collection of oral teachings, which is known as Psikto, over there, the question was, so, okay, you're telling me that the reason that Uvein and Shimon and Levi are spoken of is because we need to get to Levi? So you go through Ruvain, and then Shimon, and then we get to Levi. All right. But the question remains, so, so why did it work out that way? How and why is it that Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi were mentioned? And Rashi says that there is a deeper meaning here. Rashi is not satisfied with the first interpretation. And he says the fact that we have to have Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi mentioned the second time is Lafisha Kinturam, Yaakov, Avinu, Lishalosha, Shavatim Halolo, because our father Jacob strongly rebuked and he criticized these three tribes, these three individuals, Bishas Moso at the time of his passing. And even though we are told in the end of the blessings that ultimately all of Yaakov's children were blessed, 
But we don't read that in the scripture. In the verses, in the Pasuk, it only speaks about the blessings from Yehuda and onward. So since these three of the Shvat and these three brothers are children or sons, leaders of the future tribes who are not blessed, at least not overtly in the scripture. So Chazar HaKosov, therefore the scripture returns, the Yechasam Khan, and traces their lineage at this point here, Levadam, only those three tribes. Lomar, as if to say, Shechashuvim him, that they are important and prominent. Now that's, what, that's, that's Rashi's way of understanding verse 14. Ramban points out that if we would emphasize only Levi, one would start to think that Levi is the firstborn. Or maybe Moshe is the firstborn. Because previously in the book of Genesis, the emphasis is always on the firstborn. And here, we're talking about Levi, who's the third child. And Moshe Rabbeinu is actually the third child also. And there's a fascinating Gemara about that, about all the threes, many threes, not to be confused with the heavy emphasis and obsession with three in a different faith system. But from a Torah perspective, we say that the Jewish people, that Moshe Levi was the, Yaakov is the third of the patriarchs, and he select, and Levi is the third of his sons, and that's where leadership comes to the Jewish people. Moshe Rabbeinu is the third son. The Torah, the Jewish people are divided into triplicate, Kohen, Levi, Israel. There are three sections in the Jewish Apocrypha, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. The Torah was given to us in the third month. And many other things. Torah goes to all the threes. And that's beyond our class this morning. What's the value of three? The value should be one for us. But actually, no. There is, there is a value in three in that it serves to denote the true notion of unity of Hashem, of true oneness, not multiplicity. But anyway, let's not go there. So the bottom line is, Ramban says, we're emphasizing, no, he's not the firstborn. That's true. Previously, in the book of Genesis, the first, there was an emphasis on the firstborn, who was the first, but now that's not the case. The Urachayim says that it is customary when you coronate a king, when a, king's, uh, when a king is going to be inaugurated, that the lineage is documented. And therefore, it's only natural that the lineage of Moshe and Aaron should be documented here. And that's, that's why this is all taking place. So we went through the names of the family of Reuven. Now on to the chat, verse 15. Uvnei Shimon, the children of the second son of Yaakov Shimon, Yemuel, the Yomin, the Ohad, the Yochin, the Tzohar, the Shaul ben Aknanis, Eile Mishpechos Shimon. Okay, a whole collection of different names. And these are the families of Shimon. As we said, we wanted to repeat Reuven, his families, Shimon and his families, which leads us now into verse 16, and the ultimate purpose and goal of this entire collection of verses, the Ela Shemos B'nei Levi. These are the children of the tribe of Levi, little Doisam, in accordance with their, in order of their birth, Gershon, Ukehos, Umerori. So Levi has three sons. You'll soon see he has a daughter also. He has three sons, and the three sons are Gershon, Kohos, and Merari. Now, since the Torah's emphasis was with regard to Levi, the Torah concludes by saying, Ushnei Chai Levi, the days of Levi in which his terrestrial lifetime unfolded, how long did he live in this world? Sheva Ushleishim Umeas Shana, 137 years. So the obvious question is, why is it that we talk about the years of Levi? Why aren't the years of Reuvi mentioned? Why aren't the years of Shimon mentioned? Rashi actually spells out this question uncharacteristically. Lama nimnu shnosav shalevi. Why were the years of Levi enumerated? Look into your Rashi. The answer is, Lo'idia, the Torah wants to make known to broadcast. Kama yimei hashibud. How long were the days of exile, the painful days of sorrow and suffering? So how would that help if you tell me how long Levi lived? Says Rashi, very simple. Shekol's man she'echad min hashvatim kayom. As long as there was a member of the original family of Jacob, one of the tribes was still alive. So as long as that happened, lehoya shibud. So as long as that happened, there was no bondage, slavery, and oppression. How do we know this? 
Shenemar, because it's written, Vayamas Yosef, Yosef died. And the emphasis in the Rishonim is that when Yosef died, that they felt as if they were going into Mitzrayim, that's when things got really bad. But it says in the Pasuk, V'chol Echov, and all of his brothers. And then only afterwards, V'achar Kach, then later it says, V'yoko Melech Chodesh, a new king arose, a king who did not know or recognize the contributions of Joseph and the Jewish people, a king who began to torment and abuse the Hebrews and turn them into slaves and downtrodden and broken people. So Levi, the Levi had a chiyamim al kulam. Levi lived longer than the rest of his brothers. And since Levi lived longer than the rest of his brothers, comes out that the actual years of the Shibud were 116 years. Right? You minus from the 210 altogether. You minus now from the 210, 137. And that leaves you over with 116 years. It should be noted that elsewhere it's written that the real suffering, the real horrible times was 86 years. That's from the birth of, of, of Miriam. That's why her name was Miriam. She comes to the word mar, bitter. Thing, things are very bitter from that point point onward. All right, so now we know why Levi is mentioned and why we talk about his names. Ramban says, no, 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 you don't need to go there. The whole purpose, as we said, was to speak about the lineage of Moshe and Aaron. And since it's all about the lineage of Moshe and Aaron, so if that's the case, obviously you would say the years of Levi, because that, that was, it's all about Levi. The, the other Shvatim, the other tribes, are only mentioned incidentally. Ramban also adds, you should know that the, that the children of Levi were Hasidei Elyon, were supernally righteous and pious individuals. And they were worthy of being enumerated, worthy of being counted, worthy of being spoken of, just like the previous generations. And that is why we emphasize the names as we do with regard to Levi. And why do we mention the years of Levi? It's all in honor of Moshe v. Aaron. Because that's what they are the purpose for this entire slew of verses. As Abar Benel says, the whole reason we started this business of enumeration was only that God wants to broadcast and let us know that there was nobody else who was more worthy of leadership than these. So therefore we wait until Levi. And it's as if Hashem was like as if going through the people, going through his options. Ruvain, nah, nobody there. Shimon, sorry, not going to cut it. Levi, oh, Oh, now we're seeing a glimmer. Now something is happening. Taita says now, Ovnei Kahas, the children of Kahas. Kahas, of course, is then the eldest son of Levi. Amram, the Yitzar, the Chevron, the Uziel. Four sons. Ushnei Chai Kahas, the years of Kahas are Shalesh, Ushleshim, and Ashran. Kahas lives for 133 years. So the Kahas lives for 133 years. Now, why are we talking about Kahas' years? So Rashi says that's very important because the Torah is giving us, is giving us the tools to be able to calculate Mechesh ben Zeh from this calculation. How many years did Levi live? How many years did his son Kahas live? Anulamedim were able to learn on Mesh of Bnei Yisrael on the settlement of the Jewish people that it says, Arba Meis Shana. It's written 400 years. Sha'amar HaKosov, the Pasuk says, earlier, and then later on again, that the 400 years, Shalei Be'eretz Mitzayim, Levada Hayu, that it becomes clear that the 400 years could not be speaking about Egypt alone. It couldn't. And you ask, why not? And the answer is, because it has to be speaking. It's got to be speaking from the day Yitzchak is born. Kahas was one of the people who went down into Egypt. He was, he was alive already. His little baby sister, Yecheved, is born when they, walk in, they enter the country. Kahas is alive. Now, Chashev, Kol take all of his years, V'chol Amram, and then all the years of his son Amram. So Kahas, we say, lives 133 years. And then we're going to talk about the years of Amram, in the end of verse 20, it says that Amram lives 137 years. 
So you're going to add 137 to 133, and it's not even 133 because Kahas came into the land of Mitzrayim. He was already alive. So how, how, how many years do you end up with? Chashev Chol Shneisav, take all the years of Kahas. And Vishneis Amram, the years of Amram. Ushmeinim Shalmeisha, the 80 of Meisha. And still a Sim Tzim Arba Meis You'll only end up with 350. 133 plus 137 plus 80 is 350. Many of the years of the fathers are included in the children. The children were not born the year the father died. So you can't really, it's not, it's not a reasonable calculation to say 133, then 137, then 80. It's not a reasonable calculation. So if that's not a reasonable calculation, we have to say 133 minus off. He wasn't 133 years older than his son. Maybe he was 50 years, maybe 60 years older, maybe 20 years older. Okay, so th- those, those years don't count. And the same thing is true with regard to Amram. Even if Amram was 135 when Maishir Rabbeinu was born, which we know is not the case, it still just wouldn't cut it. Wouldn't so, it be easier to start with Yochavet? Wouldn't it be easier to start with Yochavet? Um, the Torah doesn't tell us how long Yochavet lived. And usually we follow generations. We go by the fathers, generations of the fathers. So the Torah says, of Merari, the children of Merari, Machli and Mushi, and these are the children of Ela Mishpachis, Aleha Levi, Little Desam. Now the Torah moves on to the next generation. Kahos is eldest son Amram, Vayikach Amram, Es Yocheved Dodato. Yocheved Amram goes ahead and marries Yocheved, his aunt, Loy Leisha. He took her as a wife. Vateled Lo, she bore him. Aaron vs. Moshe. Aaron and Moses, famous leaders of the Jewish people who are now going to get introduced to in all earnestness. And that's why we had this whole lineage. Ushnei Chai Amram, and the years of Amram are Sheva, Ushleishim Ume Ashana. He lives for 173 years. So Rashi says, what is the mean of Yocheved Dodaso? He says, Dodaso means Achas Avuhi, one of his father's brothers. A sister of his father, pardon me. Sister of his father. That's the meaning of dod. Dodascha means an ant. So that means. In other words, the Torah is making it very clear that Amram actually married Bas Levi. Bas Levi is the daughter of Levi. His father Amram married his father's sister. His father Kahas was a son of Levi. And Yecheved is a daughter of Levi. And we emphasize the idea that Amram married his aunt, his paternal aunt, Yocheved. Is that allowed? That's an excellent question. It's not on the list, list, huh? Well, that's what today's class is about. So what's going on with it? How does this work? Incidentally, why does it say the years of Amram? What what relevance is is that? So Rashi says, says the years of Amram to help you with the calculation. Ibn Ezra says, it says the years of Amram in honor of, their, of his children. Since Amram was, a, was, was fortunate enough to bring Moshe and Aaron into the world, that's why his name is there mentioned. But that's all about his glory. It's all about his honor. It's all about his dignity and the respect that we show him. So what is going on over here? He married his aunt? How does that work? Now, I want to I wanna just interrupt and share with you that when it comes to the a non-Jew, the Rambam says in the laws of Isuri Bia, chapter 14, that the only erva, the only incestuous relationships with regard to a non-Jew is Imai, the man's mother, Eishes Aviv, the father's wife. So if it's not your mother, meaning the father remarried a second time, you cannot marry your father's wife. The Achoisoi me Imai and a sister that has a common maternity with whom we share the same mother, the Eishas Ish, a married woman, the Zachar and a male, or Behema and an animal. So basically the Torah says that when it comes to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, erva, an incestuous and inappropriate relationship or inappropriate marriage according to the Torah is the mother, the stepmother, the sister, that's only when you share a common Mother, 
and the Torah prohibits homosexuality, and the Torah prohibits adultery, and the Torah prohibits bestiality. Those, those, th- that is what the Torah prohibits. All other relationships are permitted. It's okay, very nice. That's, that's, that's for the non-Jewish world. But for the Jewish world, we know in fact that's not the case. For the Jewish world, one is not permitted to marry an aunt. And we're talking about Jewish people here. So if we're talking about Jewish people here, what's going on? Unless you think that this refers to some kind of euphemistic aunt, not a blood relative, maybe it means Amram had a, an, a brother who married, and this is, this is the, the, the wife of an, of an uncle, one of his uncles, which incidentally is also prohibited according to Torah. But even if you think, no, Rashi emphasizes, not, not so, you should know that it's Yocheved Dodasolo Isha, Achos Avui, that we speak here specifically to his father's sister. So page Kuf Chafhei in the Biurim book, the Rebbe tackles this challenging issue and problem, which really none of the Mepharshim speak about. So the Rebbe says, Yesh lefarish. we could explain this from an inner esoteric perspective. That was the aunt of Amram. In other words, like this. With the Jewish people living in Mitzrayim, were they halachic Jews? The answer is no, they were not halachic Jews. When does, when, when does the period of halachic Judaism, meaning binding, mandatory binding Judaism begin? Matan Torah. So before Matan Torah, if somebody did something which is not in accordance with the laws of the Torah, have they in fact violated some kind of bond with God? No, no, no. Nah, they, they elected to do the mitzvahs. Okay, they could elect to do the mitzvahs. But... We can't hold them to it. We can't say, well, you had to do the mitzvahs. They did not have to do the mitzvahs. The Jewish people did lots of things which are inappropriate in Mitzrayim. And the truth is they were not held culpable for those things. When God a Torah and they danced around the golden calf, they got into very big trouble. But in the land of Egypt when they worship idols, Hashem still did all kinds of miracles for them. It wasn't until the very end he said, okay, you need to wean yourself off your idolatry if you expect me to take care of my people. So at the very end he said, okay, stop it. Enough already. But up until that point, he, was, he didn't stop them. He didn't. All of the makos, all of the plagues unfold for a people, with the exception of a tenth one, who are still steeped in idolatrous practice. We say that all of the patriarchs kept all the mitzvahs, and yet we know that our father Jacob was married to two sisters. That's a fact. How do, you, how, do you, how do you square that with doing all the mitzvahs? Avram Avinu is doing Erev Tavshilin, and here Yaakov marries two sisters. So one of the explanations is that Yaakov was not bound. He was not duty-bound. He's not duty-bound. So the Rebbe says, if he wasn't duty-bound, it was only a personal stringency, then everything makes perfect sense. Why? Because Yaakov had given his word to Rachel, he would marry her. He made a promise. A promise is part of dinim. It's part of justice. It's part of law. You have to live lawfully and legally. You have to honor your word. It's one of the seven Noahide laws. In fact, it's the seventh. It's the only positive one that you live lawfully. And one of the methods of living lawfully is to live with honesty and integrity. Your word is your bond. You said you would do something. You have to follow through. Yaakov, you know, gave his word. If he gave his word, how could he not marry Rachel? What would be the answer? Well, he got stuck marrying Leah. It wasn't his fault. He didn't want to marry Leah. Well, that's very nice. He may not have wanted to marry Leah, but the fact is he did. How would he have been allowed to marry Rachel? To which Yaakov could easily respond to that, but says, how could he not marry Rachel? He says, you want me to violate the seven Noahide laws which are binding because of a personal stringency that I want to keep mitzvahs that haven't been given yet? That doesn't work. So he had to do it. There are those who maintain, like the Sepharno and others, that that's why when Yaakov came to Eretz Yisrael, that the holiness of Eretz Yisrael couldn't take the fact that Yaakov is married to two sisters. And that's why Rachel Menu dies when they come to Eretz Yisrael. At any rate, it's not an impossibility to conceive of how it is that Amram married 
Yocheved, who was his father's sister, because as we just saw, a Ben Noach, a, a, a Gentile from the family of nations, not from the Jewish people, does not have such a prohibition. It means technically such a marriage would be under the license of, of Torah Ages. It would be, not be inappropriate. It would not be something which violated the mandatory laws of incest. In which case, since it didn't violate it, so then, so he did it. But the question could still be asked, why? Why do you have to do that for? Like, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to produce the greatest human ever to walk the face of the earth. The man who's going to bring the Torah down from heaven. The man who's born and he brings light into the world. I mean, don't you think we could have done this a little bit cleaner? Like, done this a little more appropriate? That's really the question. The question is not on a technical level, how could it be done? There are many answers how it could be on a technical level. The Rebbe even points out, I read to you from the Rambam, which is the Halacha, but there is an opinion of Rabbi Eliezer that achais aviv min ha'aim, that if you have, if it's a common sister, sister sharing the same mother, that that's also prohibited. So the Rebbe said, according to that opinion, which is not the Halacha, according to that opinion, we would say that Levi had two wives and that Yocheved and Kohos did not share the same mother, only the same father. In which case, it certainly would not have been under the prohibition of the seven Noahide laws. So, Achais Aviv is Muteres, and this is before Matan Torah, so there's no question. But, but why did he do it? Still, and Torah emphasized last week's question, Vayelech Ish, me Beis Levi, Vayikach as Bas Levi. This is like a big event. So the Rebbe says, I'll be and this can be understood from a mystical and esoteric perspective. Mavur Beteris HaKabola Vachsidis. It's explained in the esoteric, mystical teachings of Judaism. Shatam Le'isurei Arroyis, that the reason that the Torah prohibited certain relationships as incestuous, Shenesu La'achar Matan which were prohibited after the Torah was given. Because this kind of coupling This creates a very, very profound and lofty kind of oneness. But it's a kind of oneness that this material world cannot accept it. It cannot download this. The energy is too intense. Precisely because it's so high and so special. Because it's so powerful, it would actually cause spiritual fallout. This is, for example, like it's told about Ben Zoma, who was one of the great sages of the Jewish people, and a very, very humble individual who didn't want to take smicha. And he called himself Shimon Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma, the one who calls him Rabbi Shimon. And yet, this person of tremendous humility and unparalleled scholarship and great, profound piety when he was Nichnas Lapardas, when he went into this mystical reality of the, the mysteries of the Torah, he looked, it says, Hitzitz, he looked, and Nifka, and he was damaged as a result. He couldn't take, he couldn't download, he couldn't suffer or absorb the intensity of that light. Look at the sunlight, you might go blind, God forbid. When the electrician has to weld, he has a special mask. He has to see what he's doing but he cannot look and see the sparks as they fly because the light is so bright that it can blind you. So the whole idea of marriage is to bring about oneness. And this is a profound kind of oneness. See, the world says that if you're looking for a shidduch, you look for opposites. Look, because opposites attract. So I once I heard the story of a, a man who introduced the girl he was dating, his future fiancée, to his Zaidi. And he said, Zaidi, what do you say about my girlfriend? What do you say about this girl I'm dating? And the Zaidi said, I don't know. She seems very different from you. And the, uh, the boy from the swinging 60s, he said, ah, Zaidi, you're so old-fashioned. Don't you know that opposites attract? To which Zaidi responded, my dear Yankala, he said, a man and a woman are opposite enough already. <laughs> don't look for more opposites. So what should we look for in a shidduch? We look for commonality. Common goals, common interests, common passions, common hobbies. 
So here there will be an amazing commonality. Amazing commonality. Uh, uh, the son is like an extension of his father. He's got all his father's traits. And this is his father's sister. It must be very much like, it might like him. It will be the most natural kind of union. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But it would produce such a lofty energy and light, it would be blinding. There are people on a very high level. They're able to receive or they can suffer the intensity of this oneness. Like, for example, in the same story of the Pardis, where Ben Zoma loses it and Ben Azai dies. And then we have this fellow, his name is Elisha Ben Avuya. You call him Acher. He tears up his roots, he becomes a heretic. But then was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, it says, Not only did it not damage him, it brought Rabbi Akiva to the highest and loftiest level. Now, the Torah does not speak, there are 16 Torahs. There's not a Torah for Tzadikim and a Torah for Half Tzadikim and a Torah for Three Quarter Tzadikim and a Torah for No Tzadikim and a Torah for In Betweeners and a Torah for people who don't know if they're up or down or right or left and a people who are the Shoyim and a Torah for people who are rebellious. There's no such thing. There's one Torah and it's binding upon all of us. <laughs> I remember years ago, a guy, it was Shabbos, a guy said to me, Rabbi, I could do it to you. I'm Reform. I said, Bubula, you're Jewish. There's no difference to me, you and Rabbi Kiva. So we're all Jewish the same way. It doesn't make a difference. That you could identify yourself with whatever label you want, but it's all superficial and meaningless. I said, you cannot be Reformed, you cannot be Orthodox, you only be Jewish. So it doesn't matter how you label yourself, and the Torah is binding upon all of us equally. As the expression goes, Torah achas yelukulam, there's one Torah for everybody. So you're going to tell me that there are some people who would be able to suffer or download or absorb this kind of high union. So that's very nice. Maybe some people could afford it. Maybe some people could do it. But the vast majority would not benefit, but on the contrary, they would become harmed. So what do we do then? The Torah says, prohibit it. Nesu. Calls us, this is all the case. We cannot make exceptions because every rule has exceptions. Is la achar matan after the Torah was given, before the Torah was given, before this became prohibited, maybe for certain people, this could have this wondrous energy, this wondrous union that would be able to produce the most phenomenal children because of the union, the oneness that the parents were able to achieve. Think about it. Adam and Chava, Adam married himself. Not literally, but actually, yes, literally. That's the other half of him. We don't have this as it's... Christian stupidity, forgive me, mistranslation of the Bible that Adam married a, married a rib, Chav is a rib, it's Pashat ignorance. A tzela means a side, doesn't mean a rib. A rib, come and is that. It's clear, the tzela ha-mishkan, the clear Gemara. And Rashi says, that's Pshutish al mikra So he didn't marry a rib, the first person, the first person was made of two people. Two people, read Hebrew. Don't translate the Bible like, 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 a, like a, a yukul. It says clearly it was two halves. So God took a person, divided him in half, and then reintroduced him. He says, oh, meet your better half. Quite literally. It was a wonderful union. The kids weren't so nice, all of them. But, uh, <laughs> and who did, who did Cain and Hevel marry? The matter says he married a sister. But it's sister, it's incest. Well, God said that's the way it should be in the beginning. And then later, Hashem put rules into place. He said, but it's not healthy genetically. Sure, after all the mutations of people marrying and the same families marrying again and again, mutations developed. In the beginning, everything was perfect. The world was perfect. There was no issues. Okay? So there was such a concept. And there is such a concept. And that there's a very high union. And this very high union, it doesn't express itself. It doesn't work in the real world. Sorry. It doesn't work for most people. Some people it could work, but not for most people. So after Matan Torah, once the Torah is given, if it can't work for the vast majority of people or even a significant portion of people, what will the Torah do? Prohibit it. But before Matan Torah, before the rules are in place, then the exceptions to the rules could apply. And the Torah is Madge Sha Amram Nosas De Dosari. That Amram married his aunt, Nisuyin Sha Sidim Lehi Asalacham Matan Torah. It was a kind of union that would be explicitly prohibited after the Torah was given. 
but it's Kedei L'tair V'kachas Ma'alasi Akdei L'shal Meisha. The Torah is going to show you the wondrous nature of Meisha, that he was created at this very lofty union. I meant no disrespect to, to the Christian faith, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disrespecting anybody. I'm, not, uh, I'm just saying that the Bible should be read in Hebrew and translated properly. And the mistranslations are just, just wrong. That's all. It's just like a... Anyway, it's one of my beefs, the business with the seller. So getting back to the point over here, the whole message here is that this is all these verses were introduced to tell us about who? About Moshe V'Aaron. Why? To tell us how special Moshe V'Aaron were. And since these verses are all about telling us a special Moshe V'Aaron were from a mystical and esoteric perspective, that's part of the message that Amram went ahead and married his aunt. And that, my friends, is all for today. You gotta press the button there.